Revelation uh, 13, uh, the rise of the, of the Antichrist. Uh, not uh, your typical Christmas message, but we've still got a week eight out. This is, again, just our verse-by-verse -verse study in the book of Revelation. We'll continue next week, and then, yeah, we will do, uh, I'll do a topical Christmas message there uh, on the Sunday prior. We've got a kids' play that's going to uh, happen on that Sunday morning, and then for the Christmas Eve, we've got gals that have been practicing that will uh, dance hula that night for us and uh, it will be do the whole candlelight and see if you can keep from melting wax on your hands while you see, uh, sing worship songs and uh, if you can do that it'll be uh, it'll be a great time well let's pray father we do just uh, rejoice that we can gather that we can worship you and as the song said and as tom reminded us a great time to go tell it on the mountain lord we're thankful to know uh, the savior that was born uh, in a manger, Lord, and Lord, how, how special Christmas is for us that know you, Lord, but there's people out there singing about it, singing it, talking about it, singing worship songs to someone that they do not know, Lord, so I pray that you would use us at this uh, appropriate time of the year, Lord, to be able to uh, share the true message of, of, of Christmas with those around us. Give us opportunities, Lord, and we're thankful that we can study your word together, Lord, we pray that uh, uh, as the scripture will tell us this morning that we would have ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the, the idea of, uh, of the, the Antichrist is, uh, comes from a, a, a Greek word that we just kind of say in English. It's uh, the Greek word anti, which means instead of, and of course, Christo, we just say Christ. So you've been speaking Greek all this time and you, you didn't know it. It's a Greek term, we just kind of say it. Uh, into English, but again, instead of Christ. Now, often uh, we say he's the opposite of, and certainly he is, and we're going to learn more about him uh, in this text this morning, but, uh, but he's the person that comes on the scene that comes instead of, uh, of Christ. I was uh, just thinking about this during, during the worship, and um, uh, rhetorical question, no show of hands, but if you've seen or heard the music to uh, or, or uh, the Phantom of the Opera. I was thinking about one scene in there in particular. Somebody had given us tickets. They had quite a run when it was here in uh, Honolulu, and, and I know around the, around the country. But I think a lot of people went and saw that, not really knowing much about the background, about the writer, and, and really what the whole thing was about. If you ask people, do you like it? Oh, I liked it because it was beautiful music. The performers were very talented, and I would say that they were. But what the Phantom of the Opera about really is about, again, written by Andrew Lloyd Webber, the same person that gave us Jesus Christ Superstar. Do you think he might be a Christian? No. In fact, it's the opposite. He wrote that play, became very popular so he could show that Judas was really the good guy. He was the misunderstood hero trying to help Jesus out. I don't know if you ever saw Jesus Christ Superstar. Beautiful music, performed very well, but with a message that is very opposite of what the Bible says. Now, that's the author, and then his other big hit uh, is, um, is, again, Phantom of the Opera. And what is it all about? Well, it's about the Phantom, who's, again, a misunderstood hero, but he's the personification of evil itself. And one of the tips you get right at the beginning uh, of the play is the, the play and the opera opens with a giant chandelier, and it swings over the crowd and then comes down center stage. Uh, and a person is looking at it, and there's an auction going on, and the person's going to buy that chandelier, and it's going to turn out that was the chandelier that hung in the opera. And then the, the story then goes, and they begin to tell the story of the Phantom of the Opera. What was the number of the chandelier that they bid on? It was object number 666. Very interesting. Andrew Lure, <laughs> Lloyd Webber, I don't know if he's read the, the rest of this chapter, We'll look at that number next week. But even non-Christians realize that that number has something to do with the, it's not the, uh, we don't say auntie, <laughs> unless we're calling a, a relative, auntie, but uh, it's, uh, it's not the uh, auntie Christ and uncle Christ, but it's, uh, again, instead of. Uh, and they realize that that number somehow is associated with him. And of course, there's one classic scene, again, beautifully performed in the play, where this person, the phantom, is trying to lure this lovely lady 
away from light and good and so forth and into the darkness. And where does he sing this song to try to allure her into the darkness? It's in a graveyard with a large cross, and he appears and stands before the cross instead of and then sings this song to allure her into darkness instead of the light. And I remember Kathy and I were watching all of this. I think we watched the first half, and there was intermission, and we were still in shell shock because we realized that everybody was completely enraptured with this because it was performed so well. The melodies are so beautiful, but nobody was getting the story or the purpose to it. I think we spent the second half of the play just praying for people in the place. (laughs) Because I talked to so many Christians and just thought that was just the most wonderful play. Yeah, but did you listen to the words that were said? Did you understand why he wrote it and what he was trying to say? Here was a person who was going to come on the scene as a hero because he was misunderstood and he was going to be there instead of Christ and sing a song to draw you to me instead of that cross behind me. Well, that's the Antichrist. He comes instead of. Again, to give you a little background before we jump right in here, this section, we're in the middle of the tribulation. John is giving us events that have happened, been happening, that culminate to the middle of the tribulation. He's given us events that happen right in the middle of the tribulation, and he gives us events like this. It begin in the middle of the tribulation and continue in terms of the second half of the tribulation, the great tribulation, also known as Jacob's trouble, and, uh, and many, many other names. Now, Daniel, uh, and we'll make reference and read a, a lengthy reference from, uh, from one of Daniel's prophecies about the Antichrist when he comes, the person that comes instead of Christ, appears to be, a, 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 again, a Messiah that will bring peace to the Middle East and so forth. And Daniel describes him the same terminology again. Language is very symbolic here, talking about him, the fact that he has that he has seven heads and, and, and ten horns. That sounds creepy already, but again, it's just symbolic of something. Uh, and Daniel tells us that, that the Antichrist will, will be, and again, he will rise out of the revived Roman Empire. And we used to not know what that would be like, and now we just have to open our paper and realize it's the uh, European Union. Uh, and that uh, Daniel said that the, the planet would be divided into ten zones or ten regions. There would be a ruler over each of those. And as our leaders from our country, our economic experts, people from our government, uh, and people are, that are the leaders of the industrial, industrialized nations of, of the world, when they meet, they meet and they talk about the ten future economic zones that will exist in the world. And they've been doing that for a number of years. And by the way, we're in zone number one, which includes also Canada uh, and New Mexico. Well, Daniel said that this would happen in the future and that when it did, there would be a ruler over each of those, but the ruler over the European revived Roman Empire, he would rise up more powerful than the others. Two would oppose him and he would strike them down. The others would just simply submit to him after that, and then he will begin his reign as the last world empire. And that happens in the middle of the tribulation, and we're about ready to to read about it. So that's the context. But again, he comes on the scene uh, as a person who settles peace in the Middle East. He's able to establish a covenant relationship and a contract in the Middle East that brings peace finally. Uh, it will follow the designs put on the table uh, just a few years ago when, uh, when President Clinton was trying to establish peace in the Middle East, and it's known as the Clintonian Plan, which allows the Jews to rebuild the temple, their temple, once again on the Temple Mount. Now, so again, we're talking about ancient prophecies, but we, we actually can start filling in names and details. It's, uh, it's just the times that we're living in, it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty amazing. But he'll be able to do that, this person that comes instead of Christ. He'll be able to establish that. He'll be the friend of Israel. He'll be able to do uh, wonderful things. He'll be a well-liked. He'll be a charismatic leader. He'll be well-spoken and so forth. But in the middle of the tribulation of this seven-year period, in the middle, then it all changes and it all turns. uh, And that's when he really takes power over the world. And And again, John fills in more information for us here in chapter 13. Let's look at the first couple of verses 
The Antichrist is described as the who, the person that rises out of the sea. Then I stood in the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And on his horns, ten crowns. And on his head, a blas heads, plural, a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Well, we need to deal with a, a little bit of a textual problem here uh, before we can even kind of move on, because this, those verses tie directly with what we studied last week. Again, the chapter breaks and verses were added later for a, a point of convenience. Uh, and and there, there's, a, there's a bad break right here, because verse 1 really goes with, uh, uh, it should be ch verse 18 of chapter 2. Uh, and uh, it helps us set, set the stage here. Now, again, when it says, then I stood, uh, that word uh, in the Greek is, what is it? It's histemi, and, uh, and it's in third person singular, which means it can't be I, it would be first person. It has to be a he. Uh, so it should be, he stood on the shore. Now, if you just read it, I just read it, then I stood. Who do you think is standing there? I'm thinking it's John, right? He's given us the revelation. That's not who's there. It's he stood. Who is the he of the previous verse? It's the dragon. It's Satan. Again, the dragon identified as Satan. And I, uh, uh, I, I, again, I went, I went and looked in a Greek text just to make sure. It's third person singular. So I, I don't know why the translators did this, but they sure jammed us up here. But uh, so if you, if you don't feel like it's sacrilege, if you crossed out the I and wrote he, that would be, you'd have a more accurate translation. But nonetheless, what's, why, why do we care about that? Okay, and let's go back in context, what we were studying about last week. <laughs> Satan himself, again, has one final assault against the throne of God. That's what we looked at. There was a war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon or Satan and his angels. Anybody want to see that videotape in heaven? I think I'd like to see that. They may even have a video game in heaven based on that. I'm not sure. But uh, nonetheless, there's a war in heaven. And uh, Michael is victorious. He, and uh, Satan is cast down to earth. Remember, then there's a, a woe. And anytime we get revelation, there's a woe. That means... Uh, you should be scared out of your mind because of what uh, is about ready to happen. Satan is cast down to earth. He takes a third of those angels with him that side with him and have sided with him in this rebellion. We, we uh, refer to them as fallen angels or demons. And now here they are uh, on planet earth. This is all in the middle of the, uh, of the tribulation. And the language there and the metaphor indicates everything that Satan's not, he's not a happy camper at this point. He is furious that he has lost this and lost this access where he might accuse the brethren day and, day and night. And he's lost that. He's been cast down. Because of that, then, he begins to unleash his fury because he's been waiting all along. Remember in the metaphor of seeing the woman with the, with the, that represented the nation of Israel about to give birth because Satan understood, because he's a student of Bible prophecy, that the Messiah would come through the Jewish people. So if he could exterminate the Jewish people, then he could keep the Messiah from coming, and he wins. Again, he understands the end of the story. He's a student of Bible prophecy, and he has been against the Jews, whether it was Haman, whether it was Pharaoh, whoever it was in world history. That's part of what Daniel talks about and John talks about, is Satan is controlling these world empires uh, and nations. He wasn't able to exterminate the Jews. God was faithful to protect them. Jesus comes and he is born. And what's the first thing that happens then? Herod uh, asked to kill all the babes in Bethlehem. And again, a, another attempt at annihilating the Messiah. Uh, Satan is not able to do that. And uh, again, what prompts the Messiah now to come back at the end of the age is a remnant of Jewish believers that represent the nation of Israel. And they will cry out, and they will recognize Jesus as the Messiah because Jesus said to the Jewish people, to the nation of Israel, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, until you recognize that I'm the Messiah. They will, and Zechariah says that they will 
<coughs> they will look on the one they have pierced, and they will <coughs> excuse me, mourn for one as one mourns for an only child. Satan knows all of this, and ever since Jesus' death and his resurrection, he's been doing everything under his power to exterminate the Jewish people, and that's why they've been persecuted so, <coughs> so incredibly. Uh, and, uh, and, and some of us in our, in our lifetime, certainly not me, I'm, I'm uh, too young for that, but uh, many people re remember that, uh, and certainly it's in very recent his history that, uh, and, uh, that Hitler tried to exterminate the Jewish people. Satan was behind that because if he can exterminate them, there's no remnant to cry out. There's no Messiah to come back. He remains in power of the God of this age, or the prince of this world, as Paul says. So again, I, yeah, that's uh, kind of in a, uh, in a nutshell, everything that we looked at. But what was the problem? This remnant is able to escape, remember, and go out into the Judea wilderness. They're able to hide. God supernaturally protects them. Remember, we said it was several C-17s and a Navy SEAL team that got them out there, or it was God's supernatural intervention. And we, we, we kind of ended up View two is kind of what we leaned on, that it was God's supernatural intervention. He protects them, and Satan is furious about that. So now he unleashes everything he's got against the rest of the Jewish people that he can get to on the planet. And we know eventually, through this period of time, these last three and a half years, he's a friend of Israel, and now he turns against them, and he will kill two-thirds of, of the Jewish population on, on planet Earth. Uh, that is the setting that is the scene. Satan is furious. He's in the middle of this. He can't get to that remnant. And now he stands on the shore of the sea, the sea of humanity. And out of it rises an individual that he describes like himself with one slight detail because this person that's coming instead of Christ or like a false Christ is the personification of Satan himself. And he says, I'm going to give him my power, I'm going to give him my authority, I'm going to give him my throne, and I'm going to let him do his worst, because my time is limited. I've got three and a half years. That's the context, and that's why chapter 2 has to be connected with that first verse. We need to see that that is Satan standing on the shore, seeing this come about. It's his design, it's his plan, God is allowing it uh, in, his, in his sovereignty. So that connects the previous chapter, and, um, and if the uh, translators had understood third person means he, I wouldn't have had to do all that. See, we could have just gone right, right on with it. But important to connect those two. Now let's look at what this text does say. The one who rises out of the sea, first we'd see, is described in powerful terms. Again, this idea of, in chapter 17, the word waters is used to represent the sea of humanity, and, uh, and that's a common uh, look at this in terms of uh, the Antichrist. He rises out of the sea of humanity, which would indicate to many then that he is Gentile and that he is not Jewish. You've got different writers, uh, different sides of this. I think that's my general take on it. But notice that he is powerfully described again with the image of Satan, seven heads and ten horns, matching the language of Daniel, uh, Daniel's prophecy as, as well. Now there is a distinction uh, Satan is described back in chapter 12, verse 3. It says, Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. Again, diadems. Uh, again, John could have used one of two words. He could have used the word Stephanos, which means a crown. But that's like a crown you get uh, when you win the Olympic Games. It's a, it's a temporary crown. We would call it a haku le here. It's a too beautiful. It's too... Uh, signify dignity and that you've won something or you're being prized or treasured by somebody else. But it's, uh, it's not the same as this word, diadem. That's the crown a king wears. And, uh, and it represents power and authority. And here in chapter 12, we found that Satan, again, has 10, uh, again, the seven heads and 10 horns, and those crowns are on his heads. He has the power over seven world empires that, that have existed. And, uh, and in chapter 17, we'll, we'll look more about those. But notice the beast here. He also has seven heads and ten horns, but his crowns, uh, again, are not on his head, but uh, they're actually on the horns, the ten, these ten powerful regions around the world. Maybe they'll begin like uh, economic regions, the way they're mapped out now. But they'll eventually become political 
uh, and they will eventually become uh, zones of authority. But again, the Antichrist will rise out of one and eventually control them all at this point. So again, the language is to describe powerfully who it is that is positioning him in this place. He comes, in a sense, in the metaphor, looking so much like Satan himself. And then next week, we'll look at the false prophet. He is described in very similar terms as, uh, as well. Uh, the, uh, again, 17, when we get there, then we'll get the, uh, the whole picture of, uh, of world governments that have come on the scene. The, the second thing about this is, again, that he has bl uh, blasphemous names written on him and uh, and certainly some of these world empires that have existed have existed in terms of at least a, a false religious system or an atheistic worship system that comes against God uh, and, and the, the names that are written on his head which would fit with Satan would be blasphemous names. Uh, also then the one who rises out of the sea is powerfully compared to that of animals in the imagery here. If you mirror with, with Daniel is is from Daniel chapter uh, 7. I want to read a couple of verses there. Daniel 7, 2 to 8, or 2 to 6, excuse me, there. Uh, again, using the same images. One thing you'll note is that John, as John mentions them, he mentions them in the opposite order as Daniel mentions them. Because Daniel says they're going to come, John says they've already come. Interesting little, little detail. Verse 2 Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Again, seemingly very uh, bizarre vision and, and pictures. And Daniel goes on and describes one more, would, which would uh, be synonymous with the Roman Empire. But the lion, mentioned by John and by Daniel, is representative by the eagle's wings that were eventually plucked off, a beast with eagle wings, uh, indicating that it was the Babylonian Empire that Daniel lived in. If you ever look through any history books, books on archaeology, have an opportunity to go to a museum, and you look at any artifacts of Babylon, that's the image you will see. This is not, not a mystery. You're going to see a beast with, uh, with, with wings on it, uh, a symbol of the Babylonian Empire. The bear, uh, again, Daniel predicting that the next world empire uh, would be made up of two parts, one, one stronger than the other. The bear is on its side, and we know that the, the next world empire was the Medo-Persian Empire and fits that description. It's got three ribs in his mouth, uh, indicating that under uh, Kamsius, uh, Libya, Babylon, and Egypt would be uh, taken in those victories. And then the lepter, the leopard. Daniel saw a leopard, had four wings of bird on its back, uh, indicating... Again, uh, but that would be fulfilled under the Greek Empire with Alexander the Great. And, and we went through Daniel, and Dan this is not the only vision he has of these world empires, and certainly you could teach a class in ancient history just on the book of, uh, of Daniel. I remember my uh, son, when he was in school, he, uh, he was uh, in an ancient literature class, and he called me and, where is that in Daniel that descri <laughs> describes all those things? Uh, he had really hadn't had ancient history before, but he'd been through the book of Daniel. So he pretty much knew the, the layout and the major players and how it all played out and how Alexander the Great would uh, die at an early age and his kingdom would be split between his four generals and so forth. And he knew all of that because Daniel said it would happen that way uh, again hundreds of years before it actually took, uh, took place. And John now makes reference to that. He sees this vision as well. Because the Antichrist in coming to power is going to be a world power. It's going to be like these others. Like Babylon was a world power. Like the Medo-Persian was a world power. Like Greece was a world power. Like Rome was a world power. It's going to be a world power. Rome would, in a sense, again, uh, end that empire, but it would be revived uh, once again. And John sees the beast with seven heads and ten horns characteristics 
again, of the three empires from Daniel until the time of John. The one who rises out of the sea will receive his power from Satan, as I uh, mentioned. Uh, very scary thought, his power, his throne, and great authority. So uh, the beast, the Antichrist, is a person that is just a political leader doing a very good job. Uh, and we've already mentioned the fact that uh, right now within the European Union, just about 18 months to two years ago, a position was created for a person under a resolution called We've made a lot of resolutions in the European Union a few years ago, but the one that happened to be 666, hey, another very strange coincidence, was one to create a position for a man that would have great power and authority so that he could represent the European Union and go out and establish seven-year covenant relationships with other countries. And certainly one of the ones that he's worked very hard with is in the Middle East with, with Israel. He hasn't been able to pull it off yet. There's been other resolutions that give him military power, uh, and uh, in an emergency, he pretty much could take over the entire European Union. Again, that just happened within the last couple of years. We've talked about, um, I've shown you pictures of him, and I don't think he's the Antichrist, but that position has been, been created already, and we're, we're kind of living in those days. But he'll be a political leader. He'll be well-liked. He'll bring peace to the Middle East. Uh, he'll bring economic reform. Uh, and hope to people around the world. He'll be, again, very charismatic and a friend of Israel. But in the middle of the tribulation of this period, uh, he will turn, and he will have Satan's utmost help. He will, in fact, be a personification of Satan himself. So he's described as the one who rises out of the sea. Secondly, the Antichrist will be looked upon in wonder after a dramatic event, verses 3 and 4. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon, who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, who is able to make war with him? So he will be looked on in wonder after he is mortally wounded. There's, there's two, two views. Let me give you the, the non-traditional, then I'll give you the traditional you're probably familiar with. One view because in chapter 17, you've got a beast and you've got the description of the same thing in terms of the, the, uh, <coughs> the, the seven heads and the ten horns. Uh, and it's there and it tells you these are world empires that we're talking about. So if you take that passage and blend it with this one, then you would say, what is mortally wounded? Well, it's a world empire. And the Roman Empire was mortally wounded and it will be revived once again and come back during this period of time. Now, I agree that that's going to happen. We're going to have a revived Roman Empire. We're pretty close to it now. But I kind of hold the more traditional view that says this is the Antichrist. And there's a point in time in the middle of the tribulation where he is mortally wounded and he dies. And through Satan's power, he is resurrected uh, once again. And he really must die and really must be resurrected because the same language that's used here is the exact same language used of Jesus previously speaking of his death and his resurrection. And apparently the result of this, it's such a dramatic event that the world will marvel over him. Oh, he's more than a political ruler because he is coming instead of the Messiah. Yeah, that guy Jesus, they said that he died and rose again, but who knows about that? That happened 2,000 years ago. I saw this on TV. The man was killed and died, and he rose again, and everybody saw it. There's no denying it. He's the real Savior. And everybody will worship him. Everybody will follow him, and his role will very much change. And during this time, there's going to be a little... Uh, uh, some things that go on where he completely takes power now of these 10 regions around the world and begins to dominate through the power uh, of Satan. Again, we've said, secondly, he's looked upon in wonder as, he, as he's healed. Because he's healed, a couple of things in verse 3 and 4, just to note again. And all the world marveled and followed the beast, the Antichrist. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast uh, as well. Two things about this. 
uh, when the world stands in wonder of the Antichrist. That means he no longer is just kind of the, the wonder boy politically of the European Union or the United States of Europe, whatever the name may change to and morph to in the future. Uh, it's more than that now. Now the world, now the world will follow him and the world will marvel at him. Uh, and the second thing is that they will begin to worship Satan as well. That's pretty radical, isn't it? There's a lot of Satan worship going on. It's a growing thing. And uh, man, it sure seems like we're being primed for it. You know, I mean, what's the hottest movie around? Oh, it's a great movie. It's about a werewolf, about a Dracula, uh, you know, and, uh, and it's like a love triangle. But this is really a good book. A lot of kids are into reading, and we just love to see our kids read, uh, you know, and a lot of young girls are into this. And and that, you know, it's like I came, uh, <coughs> Kathy and I came out of Big City Diner um, uh, the night, apparently, that movie was opening at, at midnight. I don't know if it opened at a full moon or not, but I mean, <laughs> it might have. It's like we came walking by, it's like, what are all these people doing here, you know, at 7 o'clock at night or whatever it was. And then, you know, the front steps at the uh, word uh, theaters there, they were just <laughs> lined with kids. And we were with another a young couple, one of Josh's uh, buddies uh, uh, that he was with in ROTC with, and uh, they're over here now, and we take them out to dinner, and they knew. <laughs> they, oh, they're waiting for a full moon. It's opening <laughs> tonight. Okay, I think I heard about that. But, I mean, you know, we could go on and on. The, the world is just being, being primed for this idea of, uh, of, of worshiping Satan because he will be the, the good guy. The Antichrist will be his his man of the hour, the one that's instead of Christ. And of course, we'll get introduced to the world, last worldwide religious system. It will have its own prophet, again, referred to as a false prophet, and we'll get introduced to him next week. But it's kind of an amazing thing that at this point, the world will actually openly worship uh, Satan himself. And that's what he's wanted all along, isn't it? If you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, hey, you, you eat this fruit and you can be like God too. That's what I want. I want to be like the Most High. If you go look at Isaiah and the I wills of Satan, he wants to be worshipped. And, uh, and really, that's what so many false religious systems are all about today. So the Antichrist is described as one who rises out of the sea. There's wonder uh, for him after a dramatic uh, event. The third thing, the Antichrist will speak hateful words against God and in God's people, verse 5 to 6. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. That's the, the last half of the tribulation. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme. This is very interesting. His name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. Why does he care about those who dwell in heaven? But let's notice first again, he'll be allowed, allowed because this is all under God's sovereign control. He'll be allowed to speak hateful words for 42 months. Now, Daniel... 7, 8 says he has a mouth speaking pompous words. Uh, and in verse 25 says that they are against uh, the Most High. And uh, secondly, he'll speak those words against God in his name, but also against his tabernacle and those who uh, dwell in heaven. When Paul talks about him in 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, he implies that the boast have a, a religious tone, that people come seeking him for divine wisdom and guidance. And that's when he begins to, uh, to speak about God. And apparently he's going to attack the concept that there is one true God uh, in heaven that does exist. Uh, he'll argue, of course, that uh, those that say there are Christians and have died are not there in heaven. He will speak against them. And he's going to have to explain an event that has taken place at least three and a half years prior and maybe a little, a little, a little longer than that. And that is the disappearance of Christians from all over the world simultaneously that has caused chaos and, uh, and uh, difficulty for those in false religious systems. We call it the rapture of the church because somebody's got to explain what happened to those people. Wasn't the Bible true after all? You know, the Bible said there would be a rapture. You know, my uncle kept telling me. I kept hearing it on the radio, and now it's happened. What they said must have been true. They're all gone, and the common denominator is that they all were believers and had put their faith in Jesus Christ, and the Antichrist will be able to say, that is not true. That is not true, and he will speak against those in heaven. 
He'll speak against the rapture of the church. He'll offer an explanation for it. He'll speak against God's tabernacle in heaven. Again, his throne room, his right to rule, his authority. He'll speak against God's name, his integrity, his character, uh, and who he is, and he'll come directly against him. I don't know how he's going to do it, but again, he persuades the world. And that will be something that will have to be explained. What will, be the, what will they say on CNN that night, the, the, night, the night of the rapture? Uh, I don't know if it'll be blamed on the H1N1 or not, but, uh, uh, you know, it'll be blamed on something, you know, that um, where did all of these people go? Maybe the uh, extraterrestrials came and got us or we took a ride home with E.T. I don't really know, but they're going to have to come up with an explanation. But it peaks at this point, and the Antichrist says, I've been a political ruler until now. I'm taking over the whole thing, and there's something I will not tolerate, and that's anybody speaking about this thing called the rapture anymore. And, uh, and he's going to deal with, and we'll see in a moment, with anybody that seeks to place their faith in Jesus Christ. And that's where we get to uh, point four. The Antichrist will make war against the saints. That's in verse seven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. He's controlling the entire world at this point. Given authority to overcome the saints and make war uh, with them. Uh, uh, again, we're introduced previously to, we call the tribulation saints or tribulation martyrs that are in heaven. We saw one whole scene of them worshiping before the throne of God, having been again given a special place at the throne of God. Remember, they're, they're there at the throne of God, beneath the throne of God, crying out and saying, how long, how long will you allow this to go on? Uh, again, a, a special place in heaven near the throne of God. But uh, they have been overcome. Again, what does the word overcome mean? Well, in chapter 11, verse 7, it says, When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. That's what overcome means. It means he'll kill them. And uh, in Revelation 24, it speaks of those that have died in this way. and says, The souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus Christ and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their, on their hands. You won't tolerate any rebellion at this point. Again, he, Satan, again in our previous chapter, it's in the same context. He's been cast out of heaven. He's tried to destroy the Jewish people through whom they will cry out and bring the Messiah back. He hasn't been able to do that. God is protecting them. And again, we know they head out towards present-day Judah and the plains of, of, uh, of the Jordan there. Wherever God protects them, we know that he rescues them at the end. In present-day uh, Petra, uh, in, uh, in Hebrew, it's Basra. In Isaiah 63, he talks about that, that scene where the Messiah comes back to planet Earth and rescues them, and then he marches to, to Jerusalem. And it talks about his garments being splattered uh, with blood because he's saved and redeemed his people, defeating the forces of the Antichrist, what we call one of the, one of the battles in the campaign of Armageddon that, uh, that we'll get to in chapter 19. He is persecuting the rest of the Jewish people, and now also he's persecuting uh, Gentile believers. And he kills them, that's what it says when he overcomes. Now this leads to a very, uh, also an interesting question. And what we've tried to see is, say is that we believe the rapture will happen pre-tribulation. It will take place prior to the tribulation. And that's what we've seen in our book. We've seen the church in heaven singing a song that only the church can sing. Uh, we see the absence of the church uh, on the earth during this time period. And now once again, if you draw this to its conclusion, if, if all of the believers are all martyred for their faith, those that hold the view that the church is still here during the tribulation and are raptured at the end of the tribulation, who gets raptured? I mean, who's left? If they're all killed, <laughs> who get, there's nobody left to be raptured. Uh, so again, there's a consistency to say that the church is already with the Lord in heaven. But it will obviously be a, a horrible time. Uh, he will make war against the saints. The last thing, the Antichrist will be worshipped by earth dwellers, verses 8 and 10. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, uh, whose names have not been written in the book of life, the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, 
Let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here's the patience and the faith of the saints. So two things that are um, fairly obvious here. He'll be worshipped by everyone who has rejected God. Uh, because, because in rejecting God, they've take, they take the mark of the beast that we'll talk more about next week. Uh, and in doing so, they are acknowledging that they are worshiping Satan and the Antichrist is God rather than the God of heaven, rather than a savior, Jesus Christ. None of those people will ever stand before God someday uh, in terms of the white throne judgment and say, I didn't know, I didn't understand, I really didn't get it. No, Jesus will play the tapes back for them. They will perfectly understand if they reject God, there's only one other option, and that is to accept this last world religious system, uh, which indicates then that their names are not written in the book of life. And then secondly, the opposite is true. Uh, he'll be rejected. The Antichrist will be rejected by everyone who is worshiped God, who, are, who is a, a true uh, believer. Now, one of the things that is introduced here then is this phrase, uh, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. And uh, you need to kind of under, understand what's going on. John is talking about all these things that are going to happen in the future. And he's been gone for quite a while in, in this section. And now he just like stops and goes, did you guys hear this? I mean, it, he brings it right back to, to believers, right? I mean, he's talking about all this stuff up here. And then he just stops. Did you hear what I just said? I mean, we've all got ears, right? <laughs> if you have an ear, we've got ears. Are you hearing this? Is this impacting your life? Is this making a difference in how you think about today and tomorrow and the future? Does this make a difference in how you plan things out? Does this change priorities for you? John, John says, I've been going on for a while, but I got to stop. Now, again, this phrase was often at the beginning of the book, right? Every time he addressed the, one of those churches where there were good things and bad things, and we're supposed to learn, he said, he who has an ear, let him hear. Are you, are you hearing what's going on in the context of these seven churches in Asia Minor? And now it's been quite a while, right? It's been quite a while. Uh, and he comes back and says, are you, are you hearing this? Are you getting this? Is it having an impact upon your life? And then the words, he who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Divine retribution. Under the Antichrist, anyone that takes others into captivity under the Antichrist, they're going to be dealt with. Anybody that kills anyone else under the Antichrist, they're going to be dealt with as well. Divine retribution. And he says, and this calls for patience on the saints because there's going to be people living during that time coming to faith in, in Jesus Christ. Remember, there's, a, there's a 144,000 Jewish Billy Grahams running around at this time, right? There's 144,000, 12 from each tribe, Messianic Jewish believers with a seal of God on them. <laughs> that must really tick the Antichrist. He can't hurt them. And they're out preaching the gospel. God gives them supernaturally the ability to get the gospel to every person, every tribe, every people group, every language. Every person will have the opportunity to respond to Jesus Christ and the gospel and be saved. And then it will cost them their life. And then it will cost them their life. So there's, a, there's cataclysmic judgments of God going on. There's a worldwide revival going on. And Satan is furious uh, over the, the things that have just happened in terms of his being cast out of heaven, not being able to touch the Jewish remnant. He can't touch these 144,000. And he's just going to kill everybody else that says anything about God, the God of heaven, or anything about the rapture, or anybody that's uh, in heaven. And that's what's going on. And here John says, this calls for real patience for the saints. Uh, there's almost a sense of God's allowing this. If you're in the middle of this and reading this, God's allowing this. Uh, but God's going to take care of it in the end. Uh, you may die in this life, but you'll be rewarded in, in the next. It calls for patient endurance. Again, so how do you get your name written in the book of life? Well, it says it's by being an overcomer. So it leads to the question, how do you become an overcomer? Is it by really getting my temper under control? Is it dealing with that habit that's nagged me for so long that I know is not pleasing to the Lord? I have to overcome. No, actually, it's not any of those things. Same writer, John, tells us in 1 John 5, 4, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, 
our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. That's what makes you and I an overcomer. <laughs> it's not what I can do. It's not my might, not my determination, not my strength, not my perseverance. Uh, it's none of those things. It's not how far I've progressed in my wanting to be more like Jesus. It is just simply because I have placed, because you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God that makes you an overcomer and that gets your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, which, again, says in context, uh, which was uh, the plan of God before the foundation of the world, that uh, when Adam and Eve sinned after creation, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were not in heaven going, what do we do now? <laughs> they, they knew, uh, and it was in God's mind, and it was in God's plan to save mankind even before we sinned and, uh, and, and made that plan. Uh, and in the some way, same way, they weren't in heaven going, now who's going to lead the rescue mission? Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Junk. In a, they weren't doing that. It was in the plan of God and the mind of God from the foundations of the world to save you and to save me. I mean, we can say world real big, but it's to save each one of us. It was God's rescue mission uh, all along. And when and we come to him and accept his free gift of salvation, then he places our name and writes it in the Lamb's Book of Life. And John says, are you guys hearing this? Are you kind of listening to this? This is really, really important stuff. How does it get erased? It can't. That's, that's the whole point. <clears throat> the writer of Hebrews says he's able to save completely, completely those who God, come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. He also says by one price, he is made perfect forever those who come to God through him. And again, we don't look real perfect. We don't feel perfect at time. But it's talking about the righteous standing, the righteousness that Paul says has been imputed, an accounting term given to us, because, of our, because we're overcomers, because of our faith in Jesus Christ. We truly have something to celebrate at Christmas, this time of year. Uh, it's easy to walk around the malls and hear the Christmas carols and, and, and forget that they're worship songs. That's my Lord they're singing about. How cool is that? I remember one time we were in China, and uh, we'd smuggle Bibles into the house church there, and typically we would go late fall when uh, things are a bit cheaper in terms of the airline prices and so forth. And, and this trip, it was the first week in December. And because you got Western people staying in the hotels, so here we are in communist China, this big hotel, and over all the PA systems, they're, play, they're playing Christmas carols, singing about Jesus, and hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Of course, they can't understand any of the words, but we just thought, you know, how ironic it was that, uh, that here we are, are in a place uh, in a uh, fairly world-dominating empire that is built on atheism uh, that still plays music, and we can listen to it and, and enjoy and remember our, our salvation and what God has done for us. It, it was such a stark contrast. We, just, we were just kind of shocked by it, you know. But, you know, you can go through the malls and not even hear it today. You can turn on the radio and not even hear it. But truly, we have something to sing about, to rejoice about. How cool is this? We can walk through here singing Christmas carols, which are basically worship songs, uh, very well written, tons of, of great doctrinal statements uh, uh, in those older songs. We can actually go through the neighborhood singing uh, worship songs, and non-believers come out and say, thank you. <laughs> you only get to do that once a year. That's, that's pretty cool. And then we give them a bag of goodies and invite them to church and try to remind them uh, that who Jesus really is. A unique time. We have something to truly celebrate. We've overcome. Who's overcome? Those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ.